this day is to come as part of the body of Christ, as the community of the people of God, as we worship God in spirit and in truth. Let us worship God. This morning we begin our service. We'll be joining in a responsive prayer. So will all who are able, would you please stand and join me in reading responsibly a Lenten prayer for our call to worship this day. Lord Jesus, you call your disciples to go forward with you on the way to the cross.
come together in this Lenten season to look up to Calvary once again, to follow Jesus fully to the cross and to beyond. But part of that time is spent in devotion, growing closer in this season, knowing indeed what we can grow within our own hearts, within our own faith, to draw closer to the living God. So I invite you now to a time of silent prayer. And please use this time of prayer whichever way you feel called. Perhaps to confess your sins to God. Perhaps to lift up a concern or a worry within your own life or the worry in the life of another. So, in, Or just to be simply in the presence and in the silence of the God here this day. So let us come together now and pray our prayers to God. Surround us all by your Holy Spirit, dear God, and hear these prayers that we offer humbly to you. In Christ's holy name, amen. We have prayed separately, but now let us pray together as joining together in the prayer of the people. Gracious God, we realize we are not ideal disciples. Next week we get to celebrate with churches around our nation and around the world, literally, in a time that's called One Great Hour of Sharing. And just to kind of remind ourselves a little bit of the history of this, this comes from a time in the hopes of rebuilding the World War II, uh, war-torn uh, the, Euro the Europe nations, to help rebuild their countries. And there was a, a radio show that proposed uh, the idea of having people donate on a Sunday morning for one great hour and to send that money from these United States over to Europe to help them rebuild their communities and rebuild, literally, their buildings of their lives. That has grown and has changed over the years, and here we are nowadays where each denomination focuses on one great hour sharing in a different way. Many, many times we're able to pull our resources together and to do great good around this world, or we respond to particular disasters in different times. But it's also something that is also has a biblical foundation. You may you see one great hour sharing offering may initially seem like it just focuses on monetary donations. But in his second letter to the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul seemed to highlight financial gifts as he encouraged the, Christ, the Corinthian church to give the collection for the believers in Jerusalem. All right. I don't know if you know your geography and biblical geography, but Corinth was nowhere near Jerusalem, okay? So where he's asking a Greek church, all right, to give money to a place far away. So he's actually having money being given in a worship service and being sent somewhere else to help others. And so well, the sharing doesn't stop with coins and bills. Just as it was for Paul and the Corinthians and the recipients of our, uh, those gifts that, uh, who, of those who lived in Jerusalem, Money is often the logical and practical step to provide tangible gifts to others in need. But in our century, the funds we gather and share become very real gifts of love, 
of joy and restoration for others. These are just a few of the things that our one great hour of sharing gifts go to. Families displaced by natural disaster or political unrest are able to then rejoice to receive food, shelter, and the comfort of a safe place to begin rebuilding their lives. The worried faces of mothers whose children are threatened by food insecurity due to drought and famine are transformed to deep peace when sustenance arrives. A woman who has had to walk miles for potable water for her family smiles as she draws water from a clean well near her home. And children are arrive excitedly for the first day of class in the village's new school. That would never happen over here, right? Okay, all right. But wherever that might be, whatever schools maybe we've even had to help rebuild because of natural disasters in the United States, or build brand new schools and communities around the world, your One Great Hour Sharing Gifts respond both to planned ministries and to ministries of need that happen immediately because of disasters. To give you an idea of what we spend our one great hour sharing money on, 64% um, of that, and this is just within the UCC, 64% of that goes to health, education, and agriculture. That idea of if we are able to give people the, empower them to learn for themselves sustainable agricultural practices, they can do even better things for their families and for their communities. 12% go to national disasters, while 11% go to international disasters. And another small portion of that goes to refugee services. Only 1% goes to, to the materials that we have, like our envelopes and the things you see in the bullet today, and 3% goes to administration. Now, I don't know if you know about charitable giving, but that's a really good percentage where the majority of the money actually goes to services and to those people in need around the world. Now I'm going to do a little boasting. All right. We recently got the 2011. It always lags behind. We're still, I know we're in 2013 and we just finished 2012. But the reporting and the financial accounting always kind of lags behind a little bit in these big types of undertakings. But uh, we got a list of the top 100 leadership gifts to one great hour of sharing in 2011. And I always scan these to see if I know any churches that happen to be on there, see if there's any that are nearby. And one is very nearby, Salem United Church of Christ in Campbelltown, Pennsylvania. So we are one of the top 100 giving per capita, that means per person, for the membership of our church in our denomination out of the 6,000 churches. All right. You guys are generous, generous folks. And so, yeah, I'm boasting a little bit. I'm proud up here to be your pastor for a little bit here. But it, it, and it started, a, I mean, it's a long tradition of people being able to realize here that this is just our only, our four walls, but our ministry goes well beyond this place. And so, next week, even as we collect school kits that go to places and the people we don't know, as we collect our one great hour sharing is to go to places and the people we don't necessarily know, we can celebrate the fact that God is generous to us and has given us this opportunity to give. So, as your pastor, I want to say congratulations. All right, on that, keep up the good giving. And it makes me proud to be your minister. But also, remember, we can't stop there. Unfortunately, we could say it would be great in 2011 we wiped out all the needs. Or 2012, there's not any needs at all. But even as we're talking about 10 inches of snow this week, we know there's going to be needs beyond our community. You guys didn't hear that yet? Oh, come on. It's the talk of the community. Come on. Um, anyway, uh, we too, all right, have greater, greater tasks in front of us. Things that we don't even know are going to happen in 2013, the gifts we give next week are going to help address. So thank you for your generosity. We ask you to give another time from your hearts be able to give an example of your faith in this world and in Jesus Christ. Thank you. The first of our scriptures today is Psalm 63. You're going to hear a beautiful setting uh, by this, by I think it's Tom Fetke that wrote that, that we'll be singing a little bit at our, at our offertory today. But Psalm 63, a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness with Judah. In the wilderness of Judah, I'm sorry. 
O God, you are my God. I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands and call on your name. My soul is satisfied as with a rich feast, and my mouth praises you with joyful lips when I think of you on my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. For you have been my help. In the shadow of your wings I sing for joy. My soul clings to you, and your right hand upholds me. The second is one of the scriptures I drew from our devotional this week, from Romans chapter 8, verses 14 to 17. Many people believe that in chapter 8 in Romans it really holds the kernel of most of the Apostle Paul's theology. But indeed we have here once again about who we, what are we are called, a wonderful title that we are called as the people of God, but especially the children of God. Paul writes, For... For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba and Father, it is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. And when I read the next scripture, if you're thinking, didn't we just read that last week? No, we didn't. But we read a very similar story and a telling of that. Uh, where we read it out of the Gospel of Matthew, but I wanted to lift this up today because it goes specifically along with what I thought was the focus of uh, our devotionals meditations this week. So we have from Mark 2, verses 13 to 17, just exactly who was Jesus hanging out with during that time. Jesus went again beside the sea. The whole crowd gathered around him and he taught them. And as he was walking along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. As he sat at dinner in Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were also sitting with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. When the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to Jesus' disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard this, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. This is the word of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. I invite the children and the young people that are here now this morning to come up for the children's time. So let the children come. How's everybody today? Doing all right? It's okay, all right. Let me ask you something. What is something you guys like to share? What is something that in your regular days and things like that, what are some things that you like to share with others? Hmm. David? News? News? What kind of news? Good news. You like to share good news with others. Like when you have a snowstorm or not have a school. <laughs> that would be good news, right? Okay. Yeah, I'm see, I'm going to just go with the hype like the news agencies do. What about something else? Can we share good news? Or what are some other things that you'd like to share with other people? Anything? Not much. You guys are more generous than this. I know. I know that. All right. 
Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. All right. Thanks, everybody. So let us turn now back to our hymnals and sing, uh, I believe it's hymn 471, More Love to Thee, O Christ. And if you are able, would you please stand? Former 
wrestling coach, two former Unitarians, an Air Force Reserves enlisted woman, a town council member, and a worker for the National Park System, an art teacher, a choir director, and of all things, a lawyer. What do you think that group is? Any ideas? Those were my classmates at Lancaster Seminary. I was a sociology unemployed major, all right? <laughs> like, what do you do with a sociology major? You go to the seminary. All right. <laughs> Indeed, when we got together that day back in, uh, to be able to start a seminary, right? I didn't know what to expect. I thought there would be a lot of people like me, a college graduate who had a call and intention to go to seminary afterwards. And I thought, you know, I'll be like this nice young hip group of college students that are just going on to their next level. Instead, I found, just this is a sample, of those students that were in my classes at Lancaster Seminary. And all of those were true. Well, I, I should say the, the former, uh, the retired history teacher and wrestling coach were the same person. Okay, all right? But biology major was the person that would marry. All right, that's Kelly, okay? Our friends, Matt and, and Paul and others there. All of us had had different kind of backgrounds. I didn't even get into what some of their denominations were other than the Unitarians. There were former Catholics there, former Methodists, yeah, you could just keep going on. As well as people that were still in their own denomination outside of the UCC at Teddy Lancaster Seminary. Right? When you all got us together in a room and you found out who we are, we said, we are going to be the future leaders of the church. I know, I mean, I said, we, we're going to be the future leaders of the church. That, that's how we said it. Okay. We were confident in our gifts. We knew what we were doing. Not. Um, we just really did not expect our community to look like that. Now, what does a perfect Christian community look like after all? What should it look like? Paul wasn't even sure about that himself. One of the, one of the big things that goes unnoticed about what the Apostle Paul had to do is he had to take the ragtag group of followers that Jesus had collected and turn them into a respectable church and religion. Did you realize that was kind of on him and Peter? To kind of do that. Right? Because our scriptures only read the two weeks in a row now, one the call of Levi, which was today, right? In Matthew, it's the call of Matthew. Be the same person, or apparently certain it is. And then he has that scene where Jesus is sitting at a meal, not with the respected leaders of the Jewish church at the time, but with tax collectors and sinners. Now, even that takes some unpacking nowadays of what that might be, of who that group really was. Because we're talking about not just his 12 disciples, we're talking about others. Now, this group of sinners, we're used to the theology today, aren't we, that we are all sinners. We have all fallen short of God's grace. So as we're standing here in this middle class church, right, we're all pretty comfortable saying that we're sinners. Well, the truth is, the sinners that were mentioned in the Bible and this type of thing were more what we might call social outcast sinners. They weren't the respectable ones. They weren't acknowledging some deep theological belief that they were all sinners. Right? These were the people that society had deemed the sinners. That's different. And who might that be for us today? Who are those that we push aside, that we label, that we say that they're somehow inferior on a societal level? One of our professors at Lancaster Seminary did this with a group of uh, Katie went through his leadership now students. All right? And he asked them, he says, who are the social sinners today? And guess what those teenagers said? We are. They felt adults second judging them. 
They felt that people, if they walked into some store by themselves, suspected them of being up to no good. Especially if there was a big group. And then they started talking about some of the things that their friends went to that made them outcast from their outcast group, such as being pregnant, such as having a, you know, a reputation for maybe hanging out with the wrong crowd or maybe having to try drugs or alcohol. They said, those, guys, those people are even looked upon worse than we are as teenagers. And so it brings this idea around that we don't even realize that while we're, we, would, we would never think about, about our teenagers here, we would hope we would support them in whatever they are in life, the truth is, is that it's sometimes being a sinner is about perception. It's about how others, how you think others view you. And so Jesus being with those sinners long ago, he was with a group that had already been told and been judged by society, and they were pretty sure who it was. Now, there was, of course, the strict adherence to the Jewish laws and things like that, that kind of made you an outcast if you weren't able to follow certain things. If you were unclean, if you couldn't give away offerings, if you couldn't worship in the right places, right? If you had a disability of some kind, you were a skin disease, all those types of things were considered unclean. So it was a lot easier to kind of delegate those people, maybe, even now, and say it's some kind of societal way. But whoever group he was with, at those meetings, it was not a respectable group of people that we might say we are gathered here this morning. So Paul the Apostle, had it in Peter, we could say, and the other disciples that led the church, had to make that transition of taking this group of people that were attracted to the story of Jesus, that were attracted by this man that was bringing outsiders from the, and the unclean into a place where God accepted them for who they were. Yes, he wanted them to repent in their hearts. But there's sometimes there's nothing you can do about the way society judges you, whether you repent or not. But he was giving them a place to call their home, their family, a place where they belong. Paul had to take that group and make it into the church kind of a domino effect years later. It is today. Where we're a fairly respectable group of people, all right? With fairly respectable jobs, fairly respectable outcomes, and family lives. We're all here kind of today, kind of very similar people in many ways, worshiping together. But if we started getting down to the to the Description like I gave in that class at seminary of who we are and what we have done. Our particular descriptions about all who we would describe ourselves as, and put that on paper, the differences would start showing up. We start realizing how different we really are from one another. And that it is truly amazing that we accept one another, at least on Sunday, all right, <laughs> to come together. And to worship together. Despite our differences. Despite maybe variations in the place. If we got down to the nitty gritty of it all. That's what I think was the theme of our devotions this week. In our lesson devotion. It was about how Christian communities are not to be looked at as these perfect communities. But we're being to be looked at as this hodgepodge of disciples in which we learn in the end we need one another. But we truly do. That we realize we can't go this alone. Virtually every page, pardon me, Marty says, every page of the gospel shows Jesus uh, in, uh, coming to others. And this tells us that the closeness of sinners to Jesus' life was an important part of community. Those that came with Jesus learned from him and evidently learned then to enjoy the mixed company. Tax collectors were one thing. They were educated. The rest of the sinners that were there, we don't know what they were or who they were. But they learned to appreciate one another. 
others that we're already probably saved. Jesus inspires us and welcomes our strange assembly to walk in new ways, since we share life in the kingdom that Jesus announces and brings to life. So whether you not, we knew it, the Spirit gathered us here this day. In the name that Paul gave that to the group of people and those that turned their ways up, he said in Romans 8, children of God, heirs to Jesus' reign. We are now children of God and we are brought into this family. The Spirit gathers us with others who follow, lights our path along the way, encourages us when we falter or fail, and guides us in the fresh paths before us. So this is, I want this in this joyous season of when that Marty put before us. This idea that we're all responding to some kind of call within our lives. Is that the next step to follow that call is to be a part of the community. And to realize what that means. You know, we start saying in preschool classes downstairs at Sunday school, we start saying in our vacation Bible school, remember, you're a child. Remember that song, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. You know that song? Oh, yes. I'm setting up at the Bicentennial Celebration in Lebanon. The Perseverance Band is playing a medley of war tunes from the Civil War. And in the middle of it, I hear, I'd like us to open now into our time of morning prayer. And uh, I do have a prayer request that I got from, from Pat Steele, and I'll, I'll begin us off from sharing of our joys and concerns. She asked us to lift up a uh, Lori Kurtz Miller, who she said is a young mother who was under hospice care in her life and stuff. So uh, if we could remember uh, Lori in our prayers today. And Paul Fogel, who we found out around this time last week, was in the hospital, was discharged, I believe it was Thursday. And his, his home, it was feeling better, it wasn't didn't nearly get hit, but he had that adenovirus virus that he had the previous one, so really not before the move. But this time they were able to get it ahead of time and, and get in front of it. So, but he's back home and feeling better, and hoping to return to work tomorrow. Are there any other joys and concerns people would like to lift up this morning or here? I've enjoyed, Mom had a very nice night before the birthday on Thursday, and she was just to thank everybody who sent her cards to celebrate. Yeah. <laughs> 
die together. So that's really nice. Sister, Sister and two brothers. Excellent. Yeah, Patty. I enjoy a little uh, Jimmy and biopsy on the stroke, and it was all painful. Oh, wonderful. You had a biopsy on the stroke, and it came back painful.
So let us come together now as part of the body of Christ, indeed responding to the call and to the giving that God has first done for us, that we too might give in this community and around the world for our gifts. So let us give our morning tithes and our offerings to God.
and give us open minds. Bless this church, and give us open doors. Amen.